One of my favorite quotes comes from Steve Jobs, who said this, you have to trust that the dots of your life will somehow connect somewhere down the road. And this will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off of the well-worn path. Sage advice, but it's only half the story. The other part is following your effort. So tonight, what I'm gonna do is share with you two dots of my life, one about following my heart, one about following my effort, and hopefully connect those dots and share with you what I've discovered. The first part, following your heart. So when I was interviewing for my first real job out of college, I was interviewing for a sales rep position for Reebok. And the sales manager that was interviewing me said, you know, David, I'm not quite sure that you have the sales personality, but you've been writing me, you've been calling me, and you've pretty much been stalking me, telling me how great you're gonna be, that I'm gonna take a risk, and I'm gonna hire you for this position and hope that that translates into increased sales. And so he did, he hired me. And this was my dream job. I was always into sports and fitness. I was into popular culture. And this was a way to translate those things together. And I was determined to prove him wrong, that I did have what it took to make these sales. And I was on top of the world. I mean, this felt like a dream job for me. And month after month, I busted the quota. And I was doing extremely well. I was getting great swag, shoes, and clothing. I was getting stuff for my friends. I was getting tickets to events. And I thought I was the man. Well, at six months afterward, the luster of working for a prestigious company started to wear off. And things didn't quite feel right. I didn't feel like I was uh, enthusiastic about getting up and going on these sales calls. And I just wasn't very motivated like I, I once was. And like any sort of young man at that age, I'd stuff those feelings down. I didn't listen to him, and I thought, well, if I just work harder, I'll get promoted into regional marketing, which is what I thought I wanted to do. So that's what happened. I got promoted. I was the assistant regional marketing manager at Reebok, so I was putting on uh, tennis tournaments and road races and uh, basketball tournaments. And one of my very challenging responsibilities for this job was that I had to make sure that the LA Laker girls not only had their Reebok uniforms, but that they fit. Just right. <laughs> I know, somebody had to do it. And everybody said, David, you have the most amazing job in the world. But I was miserable because I, was a, I felt like I was a fraud. I felt like I was an imposter playing this role, pretending to be this person that I really wasn't. And this sent me into this deep, dark depression. And I never experienced anything like that. I did well in school. I did well in sports. I had a lot of friends. So this was totally foreign territory to me. And compounding the depression was the embarrassment that I didn't even feel like I had the right to be depressed. So I felt this shame about having this. And I didn't really know what to do, but I, I sure wasn't wanting to get out of bed or see my friends or see my family. And luckily, I had a girlfriend at the time who recommended that I go to therapy. And I thought therapy was just for crazy people. I grew up in Rancho Bernardo. Nobody I knew went to therapy. But luckily, I listened to her. And it was a cathartic experience in that we did a lot of testing. I did some personality testing, some uh, aptitude testing, and interest testing. And what I came to find out is that I am an introvert. And I was like, whoa, that's not a label I'm ready to take on. I thought introvert meant I'm like somebody that's a hermit and a recluse. And, and as I started to discover, introvert simply just means that when I work on things, I need to work on them more by myself. And that's how I get energy, from alone time. It doesn't mean I don't like people. It just means that I need to be more of a specialist. And I was on this track at, at, as a manager where I was a generalist required to try to inspire other, things, other people to get things done. The other thing that therapy allowed me to do was discover that I could actually do whatever I wanted with my career. I, I had this crazy misperception that because I did well in school that I had to become a, a money-making corporate executive or lawyer or business person. But the reality is, is I was going to work for another 50 years. I might as well do something that I love. And so this led me on the journey of discovering and, and doing some informational interviews, uh, looking at a lot of different career options, seeing what was out there. And I made a pretty bold choice at the time 
I enrolled in a graphic design program at UCLA, which nobody understood. None of my friends understood, partly because I went to undergraduate at USC and I thought I was being a traitor. <laughs> and my family didn't really get it because I wasn't naturally an artistic person. I wasn't somebody who was you know, drawing cartoons growing up and people were like, oh, you're super talented. But if I were to connect the dots backward, it made a ton of sense to me. Because when I was a real little kid, and we've heard about this tonight, when I was two or three, I was drawing little rocket ships. And then I got a little older and I was drawing race cars. And then I got into surfing and I was drawing surfboards and all the surfboard graphics that would go onto those, down to the even the, the little logo. And then when I was a senior in high school, I took on a little graphic design project <laughs> that uh, here was my dilemma. I wanted to go down to Tijuana with my amigos and have a cerveza. <laughs> but the problem was I didn't have an ID that said I was 18. Well, two things converged to help me on this quest. One was I was in student government at Poway High School, and I had access to the laminating machine. So what I was supposed to be doing was creating new ID cards for the new students. The other thing that converged on this quest that helped me out was that I was applying to colleges. And so I had written to UCLA, and they sent me back a brochure and a nice uh, form letter that happened to be on letterhead that had the logo at the top and a nice yellow stripe with a whole lot of white space. <laughs> now keep in mind, this is pre-Photoshop. So I took that letter and I put it in a typewriter, included things like name, date, weight of, uh, birth date, weight, eye color, all these things that I thought were in a college ID, but I came to find out it didn't really work that way. <laughs> but it didn't matter. This is all I needed to do was show at the front door at Avenida Revolucion in Tijuana, and now I could drink <laughs> cerveza. I see this is resonating with some of you. <clears throat> so now I moved into to graphic design, and I worked for a couple big firms, learned how to do things well, and then in 1995 started my own company, Lacour's Design. And we're a branding agency, and interestingly, my very first client that I secured was the architecture firm that I had a part-time job at my freshman year in college. It was to determine if I wanted to go into architecture. I decided I didn't, but I maintained this relationship with them, and they were a great first client. The dots were starting to connect. And interestingly, today, my firm focuses in a particular market sector, which is the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. And exactly what we do is help firms find their voice, find their unique value proposition, and take it out into the world and tell that story through their logo or their brochure or their website. So the same thing that I do in my job is the personal journey that I went through, discover my voice, and then take that out into the world. And so the thing that I've discovered is that I think that we all have the fundamental right to find our voice. So let's fast forward to dot number two, which is about following your effort. See, I realize that my purpose is to allow creativity to flow through me as a catalyst for positive change. And I thought what that meant was it was going to only come in the form of graphic design. I thought I'd found my calling and I was going to do that for the rest of my life or until I retire. But what I've come to realize is that, and I think we all can relate to this, maybe we have more than one thing that we're supposed to bring out into the world. But this can be scary because it requires a little bit of reinvention. And I think that that's really a critical skill that we can all use these days. Because our world is moving so fast and technology is moving so rapidly that it's quite possible that a career that we chose to go into in the beginning is obsolete within 10 years. Or an entire industry gets taken over by another industry. So this idea of being able to reinvent ourselves is really important. <laughs> The challenge is, is that it's uncomfortable and it requires to approach something with what the Buddhists call a beginner's mind. And in a beginner's mind, there are many options and in, in an expert's mind, there are a few. So a beginner's mind you know, can be very liberating if there aren't expectations, but it's also kind of awkward and kind of painful being a beginner. But what I've found is that if you, you follow your effort, you can push through that and then you come out the other side. So a perfect example of this is when I started my business, a lot of people told me, get in front of your audience as an expert, and then you'll draw potential clients to you rather than you sort of going out and, and pushing your services onto them. And that meant speaking in public. 
Well, this terrified me. The idea of getting in front of an audience was just completely freaked me out. So a lot of people had told me, well, you need to get involved with an organization called Toastmasters International, which is a phenomenal group. There's chapters all over the world, and it's a great place to work on public speaking, on listening, and on leadership skills. And so the first couple speeches that I gave were so taxing on me, both physically and mentally, that after I gave the speech, I had to come home and take a nap. I was just so drained. And then the next couple of the speeches that I gave, it was so exhausting, that, and I was so nervous that I wasn't fully breathing. And as a result, I wasn't getting enough oxygen to my brain. And I didn't pass out, but I would come back from these, these talks with this like raging headache because I just wasn't oxygenating my brain. But what happened was I started doing and I kept at it. And as I kept giving these speeches and kept working on it, I got a little bit better. And as I got a little bit better, I got a little more confident. And as I got a little more confident, I entered some contests. And then eventually that led to a point where I was speaking at conferences and events like this tonight. And now it's my passion. And so the amazing thing is that I started out, it wasn't my passion, and it was really challenging. But by following my effort, it led me to the point where now I'm comfortable doing it. And so I'm, I'm proud and excited to say that now I have the opportunity to, to speak at different events. And I've had a handful of professional speaking gigs. But to be quite honest, I haven't totally found my voice within the public speaking. I have a lot of different areas that I like to talk about. Uh, creativity, uh, presenting, personal branding. And so I, I feel like I need to follow and, and find my niche or my voice and, and be able to brand that within the public speaking realm. So I'm going to offer some advice, uh, not only to you, but also because it's the teacher that needs to learn the most. And this is advice that I need to take. And that it revolves around a machine like this. Does anybody know what this is? Just yell it out. Yeah, it's a Geiger counter. And what a Geiger counter does, thank goodness I've never had to use one of these, but it measures radioactivity. So you take the wand and you, you put it over something that you think might have uh, been exposed to radioactivity, and then it moves the needle to the right, and a lot of times the user is wearing headphones and gets <laughs> cackle that tells you that there's something that radio is radioactive. So where am I going with this? <laughs> Don't worry. What I'm recommending is you create an analog version of a Geiger counter, and I'm calling it an alivometer, TM. And <laughs> you can call it whatever you want. In fact, you're welcome to use the uh, alivometer. And what it is is it's simply a 3 by 5 card that you make a little gauge on it, and you send the needle over to the right. And you, the other side, that you, le you leave blank. And what you do is whenever you are so engrossed in an activity that it's almost a uh, transcendent activity. Uh, Mihai Chisent Mihai wrote this book called Flow. Athletes call this being in the zone. It's where you're so absorbed, you're so into what you're doing, it's almost like time stops. It's as if there's nothing else going on in the world you might forget to eat, but you're, you're in the zone and you're super focused. So what you do is when you reach that, and that's when the needle kind of goes over to the right, you take notes about that, and you write down, hey, this is what was happening, this is what I was thinking, and any sort of other details. And hopefully over time, and, and so you take this alivometer and you put it in your wallet or you put it in your purse and you carry it around with you, I don't know, six months or so. And what ho hopefully happens over time is that you start to realize there's these patterns and there's these sequences. So for example, for me, let's say every time I speak about presenting, I go into this like almost euphoric state and I feel most alive. There's a quote from Howard Thurman who said this, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs is for you to come alive. So when I look back at my life, uh, it's fun to, to connect the dots because a lot of interesting things have happened. But as Steve Jobs also said, you can't connect the dots going forward because you just don't know what your destiny is going to be. But you can use two particular tools, and those are the ones that I talked about tonight. So tool number one is to use your heart. Follow your heart to start to connect the dots, to give outer form to what your voice is going to be. And then step number two is to follow your effort, which then fills in those dots and makes that passion real.